Thank you. Therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Yesterday, the Toronto Star noted that Canadian incomes have risen by more than 10 per cent over the last decade, but according to Statistics Canada, the number of low-income persons is rising in Ontario, where growth has been sluggish. The fact of the matter is we buck the national trend when it comes to growth. And now the FAO says the latest Liberal policies do nothing to help low-income families. Mr. Speaker, how can Ontario afford to continue down this road? Will the Minister of Finance please enlighten us? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from the Leader of the Opposition and his newfound concern for those of low income. For those individuals who are most vulnerable in our society, this is the member who is saying to them, do not. That's not helpful. Carry on, please. So the question is. The member from Nepean and Carleton will come to order and we'll move very quickly. Carry on. So the question then is, what are the members of the opposition going to do in regards to minimum wage and helping those most in need? Are they going to support increasing minimum wage to increase consumer spending, to grow our economy, and to enable all of us to be better off, Mr. Speaker? Uh, Ontario's economy is growing. We have the lowest unemployment rate in 16 years at 5.7 percent. People are looking at uh, co companies and businesses are looking Thank for employ employment. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Now, the Liberal talking points when it comes to this tends to be that we're leading the G7 in growth, but we're not even leading Canada, let alone the rest of the world. Now, to quote the stats, the medium income in Ontario was up just 3.8 per cent over the last decade, the slowest growth out of any province or territory wow. over the last decade wow. in which they have been in power. I'll repeat, the slowest growth of any province or territory in the last wow. decade. Wow. That is their legacy. That is their record. This number has been attributed to the Liberals, and I quote, gutting of the manufacturing sector and the loss of 318,000 jobs. Mr. Speaker, how can the Liberals possibly be proud of this? How can they be proud and say that we lead the G7 in growth when, we do, when we're last in Canada? It's unacceptable. We have to do better. Minister. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the opposition has voted against a number of initiatives that helps those most in need. They voted against equal pay for equal work. They voted against increasing vacation time. They're not supporting survivors of domestic and sexual violence, and in fact, they are voting against being more and open transparent with regards to unionization in our labour movements. Mr. Speaker, in our last budgets, in our last many budgets, in fact, we have put programs and initiatives to grow the economy. And, Mr. Speaker, we are leading Canada. We're leading Canada in economic growth. We are leading the G7 in economic growth. We have a debt-to-GDP ratio of about 39 percent, and it's tempering down much, much more uh, effective than it is in other provinces and around the world, for that matter, Mr. Speaker. We'll take the effective uh, initiatives that we put in place Answer. to have some of the—we are the lowest per capita cost government anywhere in Canada, Mr. Speaker, and we're growing the economy. No thanks to the members opposite who Thank voted you. against those measures. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance, and you, you get the Liberal spin that everything is rosy. But you look at Stats Canada, and it paints a different picture. Chief this is actually rep. in the Toronto Star. I'd encourage the Minister of Finance to maybe read the Toronto Star a little bit more, because it actually says, out of all the provinces in Canada and all the territories, we have the slowest growth over the last decade. And whatever spin you say, you can't change the fact that we're falling behind in Ontario. And so rather than try to pitch some other story, how do you acknowledge the Stats Canada says that we are dead last? And is the Minister of Finance willing to settle for our great province being last in Canada? I'm never willing to settle for Ontario being last. We must be better. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
seated, please. Minister. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is one of the best jurisdictions around the world. We are number one in North America when it comes to economic growth. We've had over 720,000 net new jobs in the depths of the recession. And every year, even when we qualify for equalization, we were a net contributor to the Federation, Mr. Speaker, and we always have been. And in this last budget, in this last public accounts, we beat our target by $3.3 billion, with over $190 billion more investment for infrastructure. And that member opposite sat in the, in the federal party that voted in the largest deficit in Canada's history, Mr. Speaker. He doubled debt for all of Canada. We in Ontario are leading, and we're helping the people of Ontario. You see that, please? You see that, please? New question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agricultural, Food and Rural Affairs. And I know the Minister is probably just as excited as I am to head next week to the beautiful riding of Huron Bruce. You know, I love attending the international plowing match, and I love to see all the amazing work that our farmers and agricultural sector do. And I know they have a few questions for the Minister and the government. The Local Food Act passed in 2013, and in the law there was a section for the minister to set goals for, I quote, encouraging increased use of local food by public sector organizations. But four years later, nothing has happened. This section of the law has not been proclaimed. Mr. Speaker, why not? And will the minister have this section proclaimed before he goes to the IPM? Well Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for his question this morning. And of course, uh, uh, we do have, uh, we've been outreaching over the last four years, I think, at Cisco uh, Foods. We've been dealing with uh, Gordon Food Services and all the big suppliers in the province of Ontario uh, to continue to make sure that they work with our local uh, uh, farmers in the province of Ontario, 50,000 family farms, contributing uh, $37 billion to Ontario's GDP. And while I got the floor this morning, I'm very proud to say that one of the BMO Farm Families of the Year that will be recognized in the International Plowing Match is the Crowley family from the Great Riding of Peterborough. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister. Uh, you know, previously with the Liberals, we had stretch goals. Now we have outreach goals. They, they come up with new terms why they can't honour their commitments. And I would have hoped the minister has said he would have proclaimed that aspect of the act, but we didn't get that. You know, this summer, I had the opportunity to meet with the Ontario greenhouse and vegetable growers, and they had a number of concerns with Liberal policies and the impact on farmers. They said, I quote, the, their recent changes greatly inhibit the ability of farmers to plan for their investments. At a provincial level, the result will be less investment, less investment in Ontario and less stability for rural Ontario. You know, we are seeing growers code courted all the time to go to Mexico, to take Minister their investment the environment. to Mexico. Mr. Speaker, personally, I love locally grown food. I love locally grown food in my hometown and in Simcoe County. And I want all of Ontario to continue to enjoy Ontario-grown produce. But if the Liberals are intent on driving this investment Question. out of Ontario, it's not going to be here. So what is the minister going to do to make sure we keep that investment in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank uh, the member, the leader of the opposition, for his question this morning. Uh, just recently, uh, we put in place a, a, uh, a support for our greenhouse sector in the province of Ontario, some uh, $19 billion that we asked the greenhouse sector to design themselves uh, to continue to make investments in from innovation and, and productivity in Ontario's uh, very robust uh, greenhouse sector in the province of Ontario, whether you're in uh, southwestern Ontario or the Niagara Peninsula. Uh, other parts of Ontario to see this growth. Well, the question I have this morning, well, when the Leader of the Opposition was in Ottawa for four straight years, we asked our uh, Ottawa and Jerry Ritz, when he was the minister, to fund 60 percent of the risk management program for our farmers in the province of Ontario. 
He sat there, said didn't no. support it, and said, said no, no every said time no. it was brought to his attention. Uh, final supplementary, the member from Huron, Bruce. Back to the minister. I'm going to read to you a quote from Ken Wall from the Asparagus Farmers of Ontario. Several years ago, the Premier encouraged us in agriculture. She said, listen, I want you by 2020 to produce 120,000 new jobs here in the province in the field of agriculture. I was there. Ken Wall went on to say, do you have any idea how ridiculous that sounds to farmers like myself? We've got increased costs from hydro and cap and trade, and now we've got a 32 percent increase to our minimum wage rate. So, Speaker, I ask the minister, how can they grow, let alone survive, when you continue to attack their industries? Speaker, I ask the minister as well. As an advisor to the Premier, have you told her how ridiculous this sounds to farmers? Here, here. You see the police? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the, uh, the member from uh, Huron Bruce for a question this morning. Uh, I continue uh, uh, to engage the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. I engaged the, uh, the uh, National Farmers Union, the Christian Farmers. Uh, this past week, I had the opportunity uh, to meet uh, with other groups that are part of the leading driver in Ontario's economy today, uh, $37 billion to Ontario's GDP, Whoa. Uh, 800,000 jobs each and every day at a sector that's known around the world for quality and safety. We will be, uh, uh, through these representations, uh, uh, we've certainly heard uh, the potential impacts of increases in, in minimum wage. And I think the, uh, the Premier said very clearly, uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, mitigation measures as we go forward on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, and uh, as I said, I want to thank the member for a question this morning. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Deputy Premier. This morning, I was joined by 22 people from all across the province who have a loved one in long-term care. Many of them are here in the gallery now, and I personally want to uh, commend them for the advocacy that they undertake on behalf of their loved ones each and every day. They came to Queen's Park today to tell the government that their loved ones are not getting the care that they deserve. Our long-term care system is broken, and we need a broad public inquiry to begin undoing some of the damage that has been done. Will the Acting Premier, the Deputy Premier, commit to immediately broadening the scope of the narrow long-term care Question. inquiry already underway to finally start fixing the mess that our long-term care system is in? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I would also like to acknowledge and thank the advocates, the care partners, the caregivers, the family members, the uh, patients uh, that are here with us today uh, on, to discuss this important issue. And importantly, I also want to again express my sincerest and deep condolences to the families, to the loved ones, uh, and the communities uh, in and around Woodstock and London and the other areas that were affected by the horrible tragedy that led to the uh, creation of the public inquiry uh, in the first place. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have created a public inquiry to look into the events surrounding the offences committed by Elizabeth Wettlaufer. Uh, who, as we all know, was a long-term care uh, RN convicted of the murder and assault Answer. of many patients uh, who entrusted her with their care, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I'm happy to speak uh, in more detail about the inquiry Thank you. In, the in the follow up. Supplementary. Speaker, these people didn't come here today because they think that the Liberal government is doing everything that it can do to make sure that their loved ones are properly cared for. They came here today with horror stories. Each and every one of them can tell you about a time that their parent or grandparent or spouse was left in bed for 17 hours without being moved, or when they missed a meal or more than one meal 
in a day, or some, in some heartbreaking cases, Speaker, when their loved one was abused. Frontline staff are doing the best that they can, but they are run off their feet, and they need help. Will this Liberal government commit to expanding the public inquiry so that Ontario families can get an honest picture, an honest picture of the expanse of this crisis? Okay. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the public inquiry. While I appreciate uh, we do have visitors here, just as a reminder that there are no uh, public displays whatsoever allowed in the House, and I'd appreciate it if you followed that rule. Uh, it, uh, it helps me uh, make sure that we have uh, stability in the House, so I appreciate you not participating in that. My Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the, the public inquiry, uh, as we know, uh, will be led, is being led by the highly capable and honourable Justice Eileen Galiz. Uh, and this inquiry will help to ensure that we get the answers that we do need to prevent a tragedy like this from happening again. But, Mr. Speaker, the Galiz uh, inquiry will have a broader scope. It will have a broader scope than a police investigation or a prosecution. It will not only look into what occurred, but also look for any underlying issues that need to be addressed to ensure that the objectives of the Long-Term Care Homes Act were and are being met, and will make recommendations as, how to, as, as to how to address them, Mr. Speaker. Answer. And it will provide the government with specific recommendations to improve the safety and well-being of residents by reviewing the policies and procedures and practices and oversight mechanisms Thank you. for long-term care homes. Final supplementary. Speaker, the public inquiry that this minister and this government has called is simply not broad enough. It is tied to the wet law for murders. We know that work needs to be done, but a broader inquiry needs to happen in the province of Ontario. Senior care has been pushed to the breaking point, Speaker. These families see it each and every day, and they are a small proportion of the hundreds and thousands of families around the province that are seeing the exact same thing happening in community, from community, from community across Ontario. Every family with a loved one in care sees it every day. It's time to get to the bottom of the problems in seniors' care in this province and then actually do something about it. Why won't the government take this crucial, this important first honest step and look at this Question. in a broader perspective through the public inquiry? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I fundamentally disagree with the assumption being made by the leader of the third party because, Mr. Speaker, the terms of reference for the Gillies inquiry were intentionally drafted to be very broad, including the potential to look, and this is at the discretion of the Commissioner herself, to look at systemic issues of oversight and accountability in the long-term care system. We want to allow the Commission the freedom to follow whatever direction the evidence requires, and this includes specifically in the terms of reference to be able to address the circumstances and contributing factors allowing these events to occur, policies and procedures and others, but also, Mr. Speaker, in the explicitly, and I know the leader of the third party has read this. I'd encourage our visitors to read it as well if they haven't already. It, it, allows, it allows the Answer. commissioner to look at any other relevant matters that the commissioner considers necessary to avoid similar tragedies. Yep. If that isn't Thank broad, you. Mr. Speaker, I don't know what is. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Is for the. Uh Deputy Premier Speaker, and I can tell the minister exactly what is broader. Looking at the hours of, of hands-on care, looking at the funding levels, looking at the for-profit versus non-profit model. These are the kinds of things that are systemic issues in our system that need to be reviewed. For too long, this government has heard these wrenching, these heart-wrenching stories, but they've only made the problems worse. They've continued with conservative policies by cutting and freezing hospital budgets 
parents and refusing to listen to families who are telling them that their parents, their grandparents, their spouses, their loved ones are living without dignity in long-term care. Why is the acting premier and the Liberal government content to just sweep this problem under the rug instead of actually fixing it? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, all of the issues that the member opposite has articulated are absolutely at the discretion of Judge Eileen uh, Gillies. That it is almost an insult, I think, to the justice herself to suggest that when explicitly in the terms of reference it gives her that degree of latitude, as I've said, to actually address and investigate any other relevant matters that the Commissioner considers necessary, Mr. Speaker. And it includes policies and procedures and practices and accountability. It allows her to look at the Long-Term Care Homes Act in its entirety to ensure that its objectives are being met broadly across this province. To, to, so, Mr. Speaker, to suggest otherwise just simply isn't an accurate reading of what the terms and what the inquiry itself is allowed to do. It's absolutely at the discretion of the, of the, of the judge to look at the issues that the member Thank opposite you. is asking for. Supplementary. Oh, it's an insult, Speaker, that this government did not have the courage to do the right thing and are, is, are leaving it up to the discretion of someone else to do their damn job. That's what Look, it is vital that we expand the scope of the public inquiry into long-term care to look at the systemic problems. We have residents living in fear of resident-on-resident resident violence. We have staff living in fear of going to work and experiencing violence. We have severely understaffed homes with frontline workers who are getting more and more burnt out by the day. How can the government continue to ignore this crisis, continue to refuse to take an honest, full look through this, in public, inquir this public inquiry. Why will Question. they not do the right thing, Speaker? You, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, Ontarians want an answer. They want an answer to how possibly a single individual, a trusted individual, a registered nurse in a number of nursing homes and in the community could possibly be allowed to carry out the atrocious and tragic acts that resulted in the deaths and the assault of so many innocent and vulnerable individuals. That's what Ontarians are asking for. And I think, and, and it doesn't matter what the third party thinks about that issue. We know that Ontarians expect and deserve answers to that horrific right. set of circumstances yeah. that we've all witnessed over the course of the past year. Mr. Speaker, that's why we've appointed Justice Eileen Galiz, who is highly capable highly. and even and from the local area, Mr. Answer. Speaker, with remarkable expertise that can address this effectively. Thank you. Sup final supplementary. No doubt that people want those answers, but Ontarians want and deserve answers to so much more of what's going wrong in long term care today. Our parents and grandparents don't have to live like this. It does not have to be this way. We can actually take action to fix seniors' care in Ontario. We can give our loved ones the care and the dignity, Speaker, the dignity every single day that they deserve. So will the Acting Premier do the right thing? Acknowledge that the scope of this inquiry is not broad enough to answer all of the questions, all of the questions that people have about our failing long-term care system and take this important moment and seize this important moment, take the chance and make this uh, long-term care better for seniors in Ontario, Question. commit to the broader inquiry, and then commit to fix the system. Well, Ms. Mr. Speaker, uh, I am absolutely confident that Justice Gillies will be addressing the issues that are critically important to Ontarians to ensure the safety and security and the quality of care for individuals that we, that we entrust to our long-term care homes uh, to provide them with that highest quality of care, uh, particularly when they're vulnerable. And Justice Gillies, uh, who has uh, 
enormous experience both at the Superior Court and Appeals Court, but she was Dean of the and Professor of Law at the University of Western Ontario's Faculty of Law. She was named a leading educator of the world in 2008 and one, was one of Canada's top 100 women shortly before that, Mr. Speaker. She has an impeccable legal record, and I have no doubt at all, and Answer. I hope that all of us can trust this remarkable individual to do the work that's required, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds. Right. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My, uh, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board. The Premier was adamant that she was testifying at the Sudbury bribery trial as the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. In fact, she swore an oath on the Bible and opened her testimony by saying, I am the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask who paid for the Premier's flights and accommodations in Sudbury? Who paid? The Liberal Party? Or the taxpayers of Ontario. President of the Treasury Board. Over to the Deputy Premier. Deputy, Deputy Premier. Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question, and thank you for clarifying the role of the Premier yesterday. Unlike what your leader has done, um, Speaker, there has been this has been in the public realm for some time. We've been very clear that the all sides. That is not appropriate. Finish, please. Uh, speaker, the Ontario Liberal Party is paying for Pat Sorbera's legal bills, for Jerry Lawley Jr.'s legal bills, and for the Premier's legal bills. Speaker. Yep. Supplementary. Uh, thanks. Uh, back to the Minister. The Premier, as the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, didn't travel alone to Sudbury. So I asked Mr. Speaker who paid for the Premier's staff's flights and accommodations in Sudbury, who paid, the Liberal Party or the Ontario taxpayer? Speaker, um, the Ontario Liberal Party, uh, as we have said, but Speaker, I see that the leader has uh, stepped out. Uh, Stop. And this is where And this is where we want to go. I'm not. Every member knows better. Every member knows better. Don't turn this into something you would regret. The member should not have done that. Carry on. Apologize, Speaker. Uh, the Ontario Liberal Party is paying for those bills. Thank you. New question. The member from London Fanshawe. My question is to the acting premier. The Lyota family has recently reached out to my office. Their mother, Joanne, was living in a long-term care in London. The Lyoti family expected that their mother should have received the best care possible. But when their mother, Joanne, suffered a stroke, she waited hours before receiving any medical attention or assistance. In fact, it was discovered by a privately hired companion who finally brought her mother to hospital. As a result of their mother, Joanne, being left unattended, she suffered irreversible brain damage and later passed away. That kind of tragedy should never happen to anyone in a long-term care home in Ontario. Is the Premier, is the acting Premier ready to listen Question. to families like the Lyotes and take action to fix the crisis in seniors' care? Thank you. Thank you. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, and first of all, my uh, sincere condolences. My heart goes out to uh, this family that has uh, had to bear um, an extremely unfortunate unfortunate tragedy, uh, and I'm I'm sorry to hear that, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are. Uh, making significant uh, investments in the long-term care system. We've been doing that since 2003 when we first came into office where we have approximately doubled our investments in long-term care. We have uh, increased the number of long-term care beds right across this province by 10,000 beds uh, since that time, Mr. Speaker. We are in the process of redeveloping a further 30,000 beds. Uh, in, even in this year's budget, Mr. Speaker, we had a significant allocation, an allocation, Answer. an increase to long-term care homes that the third party voted against, uh, which would continue to demonstrate that this is a high priority for this government. Thank you. Speaking supplementary. Supplementary. Speaker, the Lyoti family is not alone. There's many more families here today and thousands of families and their loved ones have experienced the crisis in seniors' care across Ontario. For some of those families that are here with us today to speak up for the care that our parents and grandparents deserve, and what I want to do, Speaker, is thank them for their courage for doing so. Frontline workers are doing the best they can, but homes are chronically underfunded and understaffed. 30,000 people can't even get a long-term care bed that they need. Instead of families spending quality time with their loved ones, they are spending sleepless nights worrying about the safety of our parents and grandparents in long-term care. <laughs> Is the Ashton Premier prepared to do the right thing for families here today and expand the mandate of the public inquiry to look at the systemic problem in long-term care? Help. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, there's nothing more important to me as minister and us as government than the safety and security of Ontarians, including especially uh, our seniors who find themselves uh, in our long-term care system. Uh, we have a debt of responsibility. We owe them a debt of gratitude, and we have a responsibility to ensure that that care is of the highest quality. This year, we increased uh, the budgets of our long-term care homes, uh, 60 million new dollars going into resident care needs, including specialized supports for those most complex uh, individuals, an additional 10 million for more than 50 million for behavioral supports, which is important because of the increased number of seniors with dementia, Mr. Speaker. We increased the raw food envelope for the diet for the meals by 6.5 per cent this year. Those are just three examples how we continue to invest, but three examples that the third party voted against, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. It's an important question for those of us from the Ottawa region who were affected by the, the story of Rowan Stringer. And for all parents like me who want to encourage their children to be active, to participate in sports and team sports, but who are worried for their safety. It's an important question for all Ontarians who are interested in safety in sports. 17-year-old Rowan Stringer's life was cut short as a result of a head injury she sustained while playing rugby with her high school team. A coroner's inquest was conveyed and in 2015 to look into the circumstances of Rowan's death. The coroner's jury made 49 recommendations Question. for governments, school boards and sport organizations to prevent concussion. The Rowan's Law Advisory Committee was created through a private member's bill that the MPP McLeod, MPP Fraser, and Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Ottawa Venue for her question. And thank the members of this House who introduced Rowan's Law, and also thank our committee members, some of whom are here today, for their critically important work. In particular, I'd like to thank Committee Chair Dr. Dan Cass, VP Medical at St. Joseph's Health Centre, for his leadership. And I especially want to thank Gordon Stringer, Rowan's dad, 
who was able to channel his grief into this work that will have a lasting and meaningful impact. The committee met eight times this year, and the unique perspective of its members have all contributed to a comprehensive report, which we were proud to table this morning. The report makes recommendations to our government with ambitious but practical steps to make our schools, arenas, playing fields and communities safer. Every Ontarian should have the opportunity to safely participate in sport, and we expect the committee's thoughtful input will, put Ontario, will make Ontario a national leader in concussion safety. Speaker, I hope all members of the House will read yes, the sir. report, and I look forward to adding more information in my supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Uh, yes, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for her work on this issue. It's is a priority for all of us, and I'm pleased to see this important progress. In order that sports be played safely, it's important that all sectors work together and be supported by coordination. Minister, maybe to update this House on the government's response to this important report. See, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again. I'd like to thank the member for her question. Our government understands the importance of creating a world-class amateur sports system where athletes can play safely. That's why I'm happy to inform the House that our government is taking decisive action, informed by the comprehensive feedback in this report. Working with sport and healthcare leaders, the province will review and work to implement the report's recommendations to make our sports system as safe as possible. As part of this, our government in intends to introduce legislation that, if passed, would govern amateur sport across Ontario and serve to change the conversation about concussion protocol in Ontario and across the country. Speaker. This report will inform our government's next steps and will have an important focus on surveillance, prevention, detection, and increased awareness. Speaker, above all, we want to honour Rowan Springer and her memory to ensure that other athletes and families are spared such an agonising loss. Thank you, Mr. Answer. Thank you. Your question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sauer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The current Long-Term Care Act includes enforcement tools like suspension, license suspensions, financial penalties, duty to report, and the Residents Bill of Rights. Yet life for seniors in long-term care is getting harder and more tragic. Sadly, cases of vile abuse, neglect, and sexual assault persist. I want to know, Speaker, why isn't the minister and his government protecting seniors in long-term care by enforcing the existing That's a law? Great great Thank you, Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we are enforcing the law. And we're, in fact, I will be uh, later this fall. I'll be introducing legislation to further strength strengthen our ability as a government to oversee and inspect uh, and protect uh, long-term. Well, I mean, the, the I know there's heckling coming from the official opposition. In fact, unlike the progressive conservatives, we were the first party to actually implement that 100 percent of long-term care homes in this province would even have to undertake an annual inspection. Under the progressive conservatives, they were not inspected, Mr. Speaker. So 100 percent of the long-term care homes are being inspected. And what we're seeing, we're already seeing the results of those inspections because we're seeing that the orders that Order. are being issued by my ministry inspectors that year over year, the number of orders Answer. that need to be issued is going down, and that's because that's through the inspection process, our long-term care homes are getting better. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Not, a shake head. not only is the minister not enforcing the law, we've also learned that he's been sitting on recommendations that were a blueprint for change to protect seniors in long-term care. From the 2005 Casa Verde inquest into murders in long-term care, less than 30 per cent of the recommendations have. To the Shirley Sharkey and Gail Donner reports, this government and minister have had hundreds of recommendations from the multiple task forces, inquiries and reports over the last 14 years. Wow. To quote the minister in an early, earlier comment he made, the people of Ontario want to know, why have you been sitting in all these reports and inquiry recommendations and not help our senior citizens and residents? Here, here. Thank you. Minister. Well, there have been a lot of reports, and we've benefited from the expertise behind them. It's easy for the member opposite to cherry-pick the ones that he wants, but what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is this fall we're introducing further legislation beyond the 100 per cent inspections that we implemented under the previous Minister of Health this is to my left. We are implementing further measures to further strengthen our ability to oversee and to ensure that the Long-Term Care Act is enforced and adhered to. 100 per cent by 100 per cent of our long-term care homes, Mr. Speaker. So consistent and consonant with our con 
At the same time, Mr. Speaker, as we invest in our long-term care system, we are tightening and improving and strengthening the regime, a regime that didn't exist under the Progressive Conservatives. Yeah, they right. did not see this as a priority whatsoever Answer. when they were closing 10,000 hospital beds. They ignored the long-term care sector. We're investing, we're investing in Thank oversight you. as well. New question, member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Yesterday, the Premier of Ontario took the witness stand in the Sudbury bribery case. Her testimony leaves Ontarians with even more questions. She seemed to have forgotten quite a few of the details of the interactions between herself and the Minister of Energy during the Order. time that her party was courting him to run for them. For example, the Premier couldn't remember if she ever talked to the Minister about paid jobs for his staffers. Does the Acting Premier know why she had so much trouble remembering details yesterday on the stand? Well, thank you, Speaker. And, uh, Premier Wynne has been very open with the legislature, with the media, with the public about the allegations related to the Sudbury by-election. Speaker, as I'm sure everyone knows, parliamentary privilege extends to all members of the legislature and, and uh, really exempts a member from the normal obligation to uh, attend court if summoned as a witness. The Premier, however, chose to waive that privilege and appeared yesterday. Speaker. And she was open, she was transparent, and everything that she said is on the public record. Speaker, this issue is before the court. We must let it, that's where it must be. Thank you. Supplementary. Again to the Deputy Premier. The Premier has claimed over and over again that throughout this entire scandal that she has been transparent here in this House and with the media. But yesterday, when she was on the stand, we learned a whole slew of new information from her that she had not disclosed in this House. Her recall was inconsistent. Does the acting Premier think that the Premier just suddenly remembered those details, or does she care to explain why the Liberal Party's definition of transparency is different from everyone else's in this province? As has been said multiple times, this is an issue before the courts, and that's where it will stay. Thank you. The question, the member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of International Trade. Now, Speaker, it's well known that the process of modernizing the North American Free Trade Agreement is currently well underway, and the overarching benefits of this agreement for all three parties are well documented. In 2016, in fact, Speaker, the trilateral trade among Canada, the U.S., and Mexico reached Canadian $1.4 trillion, more than a threefold increase since 1995. And is this trade interdependence that supports millions of jobs across North America and strengthens trade and investment in Canada? Unique in its makeup, NAFTA is a robust trade agreement that covers a wide array of sectors, many of which are the backbone of local economies across Ontario, such as the auto sector. Now, Speaker, our Premier and Minister Chan have worked tirelessly to ensure that the views of Ontario on this important trade agreement are brought to the negotiation table week in and week out. Question. So, Speaker, will the Minister provide the House with an update of the ongoing negotiation process? Thank you. Minister of International Trade. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, for the opportunity. Speaker, before I answer the question, allow me to. To say a, a couple of words of uh, the passing of understand. He was uh, a good friend of mine, a great colleague. He was my first. Chief of Staff. It's a great personal loss to my family and a huge heart to the community. I ask the member to ask the second question, please. Ask the second question. Thank please. you.
Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. And um, I too know Mr. Chan, and he was an extraordinary Ontario, and he worked in the Premier's office, and I had a pleasure on many occasions. And if the minister would like to take another minute and a half to talk more about Mr. Chan's legacy, I would be happy to ask him this question on another date. As important as our North American free trade agreement negotiations are, nothing trumps personal relationships in this House or in our lives. And with great respect, I would ask the minister if he'd like to say a few more words, be welcome to, or speak to the agreement as he wishes. Thank you. Minister of International Trade. I know he's a great guy. He's a person who never stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> During his two years with me and because of the culture that he was able to give me so much advice, so much meaningful direction of running my ministry. And three weeks ago, he gave me a phone call and got my family to his house. And uh, he told me there's no more, no more medicine. The doctor advised him after five doses of trial medicine, they decided there's no more. So at that time, he told me the fight, the battle will be between his body and the cancer. Needless to say, I expect this. And he told me that, Michael, I'm dying. I'm dying. And that's a message from him. So uh, we had a very good talk. It will be a, a good uh, funeral. I talked to the family, so you know what, Speaker, life to everyone is short. So enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting uh, Premier. More than 5,000 basements were flooded by a record-breaking rainfall in Windsor, Essex. Uh, the Windsor Star noted the disastrous storm of the century that swamped Essex County in late August caused $175 million in damage to homes in Windsor alone, and that number is likely growing. According to the Windsor Star, even the minister doesn't hold out much hope. The province's disaster assistance program will be able to cover the cost and help those Chief impacted. Whip, second time. Mayor Dilkins told the reporters it's likely there is going to be thousands of people in Windsor and Essex who simply can't get insurance, who can't get help. The province must step up and must help these families. Mr. Speaker, Will the acting premier promise they won't turn their back on the people of Windsor during this hour of need? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I'm uh, happy to take this important question on behalf of our colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I know that he's, over the last number of days, had the opportunity to not only respond to questions on this very grave and important topic that's affecting the people of Windsor and Essex. Uh, I know that he's had the chance to speak to municipal representatives and leaders in that part of the province about the challenges that the people of their respective communities are facing. I know he's also paid a personal visit down to the area to see firsthand uh, about exactly what the, uh, the circumstances look like on the ground. I know that just, I believe, yesterday, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs I uh, did reference specifically that the, uh, that the program, the Disaster Recovery Assistance for Ontarians program, uh, has gone forward. It is performing as the program is designed to perform. Uh, speaker, but having said all of that, I, I know that the minister uh, yeah, again yesterday spoke to some of the some of the challenges with respect to what's taking place around private insurance Answer. versus not 
But I know this minister and his team, his officials, are, are on the ground. They're doing the work that needs to be done. They'll continue to talk to, mayor, to the mayor of Windsor and other mayors in the area and the residents to make sure that we strike Thank the you. right balance. Thanks very much. Speaker. Supplementary, the member from Chatham, Ken Essex. Speaker, uh, back to the acting premier. Uh, the disaster relief program does not cover damages to homes that were flooded due to sewage system backups. But according to one restoration company, every home we've been to, it's been due to sewage backup. Windsor Mayor Drew Dilkins is asking the province to create a comprehensive, affordable insurance package homeowners can buy if they can't get flood insurance. But instead of taking action, the Premier only issued a vague tweet about the flooding and would rather be in Washington than Windsor. Pretending to care on Twitter or leaving the country just isn't good enough, Acting Premier. So, Acting Premier and Speaker, what assistance will the Acting Premier actually provide to the people of Windsor hurt by the flood? Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. As I said in the, uh, the initial answer to the first question from the Leader of the Opposition, uh, Minister Morrow uh, has been to the area. He's spoken to the mayors. Uh, he referenced this exact issue around uh, sewer or sewage backups uh, yesterday in this legislature in response to a question from the member of the NDP caucus from the Windsor area. He did say, Minister Morrow did say yesterday, that uh, insurance coverage for damage that's caused by sewer backup is widely available. Uh, the program uh, that we have in place, Speaker, is there and it's designed to help deal with what's known as overland flooding, Speaker. This is not to suggest in any way, shape or form that there is not a great deal of concern on the part of the Minister or our government or the Premier or everyone on this side of the House with respect to the challenges that the people of this region and the province are facing. It's why the Minister spoke very, very quickly to all of the mayors in the area. It's why he's paid a personal visit to this particular area, Speaker. It's why he and our government championed the need to invest significantly more money, hundreds of millions of dollars more, Speaker, yes, in dealing with uh, issues relating to uh, water and wastewater, which will help improve some of the challenges in the long term, Speaker. I know the Minister will continue to be vigilant and work with the communities that are affected to make sure that we get it right. Thank you. Thanks very much. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to actually begin by extending uh, sincere condolences on behalf of my NDP caucus and New Democrats around on Ontario to the Minister of uh, International Affairs, the Minister of Economic Development and Trade, and all of the friends and family and loved ones of, uh, of MP um, Arnold Chan. Uh, his loss, I'm sure, will be very, very Uh, but I do have a question, of course, Speaker, and my question is to the Deputy Premier. My hometown of Hamilton has had 79 Code Zero events this year so far. For those of you who aren't aware of what a Code Zero is, a Code Zero is when one or even zero ambulance, ambulances are available to be dispatched when someone calls 911. Hamilton is a community of over 525,000 people, Speaker, over half a million people. There are life-threatening events that occur uh, sometimes two or three times per week. These are life-threatening events that occur, rather, sometimes two or three uh, times a week in Hamilton, a code zero two or three times a week. People deserve to know that when they call 911 in an emergency, that help's going to be there for them. Question. Why won't the Liberal government do the right thing? Stop underfunding health care in this province and make sure that when there's an emergency, Ontario families have the confidence uh, that they need to know that help will Thank come you. when they call 911. <coughs> Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, always concerned whenever I hear uh, messages like this. I'm well aware of some of the pressures that exist around the province. Fortunately, Mr. Speaker, our municipalities uh, across the province work uh, well together, so if there's a challenge faced by one, another municipality uh, often and generally has the opportunity to step up without any negative impact on patient care response. But, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the leader of the third party uh, raises an important uh, issue where we know that we can do better when it comes to dispatch and fully utilizing and effectively utilizing our paramedics and our uh, EMS services. And so, in, uh, in fact, in a number of weeks, I'll be introducing legislation that I referred to back in June, which will allow our EMS workers to 
do a number of things Answer. that will make them more available, allow them, for example, to treat and release low-acuity patients, uh, uh, particularly individuals who don't require medical care, or divert them to places other than hospitals, which might be more appropriate. Thank this you. is what we'll be introducing shortly. Supplementary. Speaker, perhaps the Minister of Health doesn't realize that a woman in Hamilton lost her life recently because it took almost an hour for an ambulance to get to her, and now the coroner is actually reviewing this set of circumstances. It is unacceptable, unacceptable that anyone has to wait that long for an ambulance. An ambulance has to offload patients in the hospital before it can be dispatched again. Everybody knows that. But frozen hospital budgets have meant that this process is taking longer and longer and longer. Hamilton paramedics and city staff attribute our Code Zero incidents largely to these increased hospital waits. And the Ontario Hospital Association itself has said that without immediate action, this crisis will only get worse. Can the acting premier tell me, was it the Liberals' plan to put the bottom line ahead of people's lives when they cut health care services uh, for families that families can't on in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's hard not to find offence with that question, but that— Leader of the third party, please come to order. And the member from Beaches, East York. Carry on, please. So I was going to say, Mr. Speaker, that despite the nature of the question, uh, uh, I was going, I'm choosing to answer it in a respectful way, that um, we are working across the system, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm happy to understand now that this is really a question about hospital funding. Um, but we're investing in our ERs. We're investing in our ERs, Mr. Speaker, for what's known as pay for performance, where we uh, are directly addressing the offloading challenges that certain hospitals face. But, Mr. Speaker, we are implementing a new uh, IT Answer. algorithm that is going to divert. It's going to be able to predict the, the patients that need the support quickly. But we're making important things, and I think probably the most important things paramedics will tell you is the diversion, where individuals, paramedics, are going to be Thank able you. to take people away from hospitals in the first place. Thank you. New question, member from Metropolitan. Long-term care, Speaker. I begin by quoting uh, the late MP Arnold Chan from Scarborough Agent Court, who said in his final address to the federal parliament, "I would ask Canadians to give heart to their democracy, that they treasure it and they revere it." Like former MP Chan, Speaker, I know that our government believes that everyone in the province deserves high-quality health care that is compassionate, timely, equitable, research-based, and in the best interests of our patients. In particular, that includes those fighting substance use disorders, which are increasingly prevalent. Speaker, we've been clear as a government through the past year that what we're dealing with is a crisis. The opioid crisis has unfortunately taken far too many lives and led to debilitating dependence and addictions. Last year, our government put in place the most comprehensive opioid strategy in the country and also announced additional investments on this, in this file. Would the minister please inform this House about the critical investments our government is making to provide urgent Question. support to those affected by the opioid crisis? Thank you. Minister of Health, long-term care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke North as well for giving me this opportunity. And I want to start, if I can, Mr. Speaker, by acknowledging uh, those uh, who have tragically and, and needlessly, Mr. Speaker, lost, lost their lives due to the, uh, the, the public health crisis that we're facing, the opioid crisis, Mr. Speaker. Regrettably, 865 uh, uh, precious souls, individuals, lost their lives last year. Uh, that's a 19 percent increase from the previous year. Nothing like what they're seeing in B.C., where they saw an 88 percent year-over-year increase. But nonetheless, a single life lost uh, is a tragic loss uh, to that individual and their loved ones. And I, I want, Mr. Speaker, also to acknowledge and recognize the, the true heroes of our health care system, the frontline workers who, whose commitment and compassion under extremely difficult circumstances have saved the lives of so many. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the lives of those with opioid use disorder Order or substance use disorder, uh, they, those lives matter. Those people are valued and they're important, and they are not alone, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from the Republic of North and Supplement. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you as well, Minister, for your stewardship of this important issue. Uh, as we know, we've attempted to uh, bring to bear a number of investments, uh, critical 
uh, as they are uh, in the health care system to ultimately benefit individuals, families and the communities that are fighting these substance abuse disorders. And I have to say, Speaker, that uh, I have personally witnessed in both a parliamentary and professional capacity the results of those investments. Uh, speaker, our sloganeering opposition believes that merely banning pill presses is the answer to the opioid crisis. In contrast, our government recognizes, as with all things concerned in medicine, that we need to address the spectrum of issues, in particular to prevent new instances of opioid dependency and also to care for those already affected. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care to weigh in on why banning pill presses is merely a band-aid solution to a public health crisis that deserves a full spectrum treatment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and if I can, let me be clear on one thing. Focusing on restricting access to pill presses in Ontario is not going to solve this issue. In fact, the federal government has already passed legislation that prohibits and bans and makes illegal the importation of pill presses anywhere into this country without a license, Mr. Speaker. But it is, this is an issue which is far more complex and multifaceted and can't be, in fact, I would argue that a illegal drug manufacturer in his basement, the last thing that he's concerned about is the legality of the pill press that he's using to make illicit drugs for distribution on our streets, Mr. Speaker. But this, this opioid use disorder crisis deserves much more from us, and that's why we've invested to date almost $300 million over the next two and a half years, Mr. Speaker, and it's everything from the distribution of naloxone, more than 7,000 doses of naloxone Sir. going out each and every month, to making rapid access to a medical treatment, support, detoxification available to those who do seek help, and many, Thank many you. other things, Mr. Speaker. Question the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday, a major international energy company started construction activities in Prince Edward County. And I know that the Minister of Energy has said on numerous occasions that we don't need more power. We have an oversupply in Ontario. And I know that you know that the company uh, isn't welcome in Prince Edward County. Prince Edward County is an unwilling host community. Your government even had grounds to kill this project when the Environmental Review removed more than 60 per cent of its generating capacity recently, removing the number of wind turbines from 29 down to nine in this environmentally sensitive area. But what did you do? Your government changed the contract for them to allow them to continue and build this unnecessary wind project. Speaker, the government knew that the company was violating the terms of its contracts, and why did it refuse to do the right thing? Why did it not step in and protect electricity customers in Ontario for another expensive, unreliable, unwanted— Thank you. <coughs> Deputy Premier. The Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Minister. Development and Growth. Well, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I can't, uh, I can't uh, opine on, the, on this specific contract. The Minister of Energy might have some more specific information he could share with the member on this. Other than say that this government has prioritized environmental protection as part of our renewable project uh, considerations. Uh, and we've, we've uh, amended our system significantly over the years to accommodate as much as possible uh, municipal input. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, and I hear the members opposite uh, squawking about not caring, but the fact is what we do care about, Mr. Speaker, is having a clean Order. future for the province of Ontario. What we do care about is the health of each and every Ontarian, man, woman and child. And Mr. Speaker, most of us spent the last weekend Member riveted Perth, to CNN, Wellington. watching the ravages of climate change Answer. as it hit Texas, as it hit Florida. Mr. Speaker, we're going to do what we need to do to build renewable energy in this province because it's Thank the right you. thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the government has said on a number of different occasions that these wind turbines are producing unwanted unreliable, unnecessary electricity, and we know that it's driving up our skyrocketing cost of electricity in Ontario. This one has been reduced by an environmental review tribunal in Prince Edward County that said this is the wrong place for environmental reasons to locate a wind turbine project. Speaker, the Ministry of Energy has told me and the IESO has told residents of the county 
that they take the long view on commercial operation dates, often extending them by 18 months. This project is behind by more than three years, yet the government has given it the rubber stamp and actually made the case that it should go ahead with less capacity. This is an unnecessary project. Question. Could it be that the fact that this foreign company donated on five separate occasions to the Ontario Liberal Party, that the government has made this adjustment to the contract? Minister. Mr. Speaker, that party will go to any lengths to discredit anything that we've tried to do over the last dozen years to reform our energy system and remove us from coal to cleaner sources of power. But, Mr. Speaker, as I said in my first, my first uh, answer to the question, Mr. The member from Huron, Bruce, will withdraw. Withdraw. Warned. Spent a good part of the last week looking at the ravages, Mr. Speaker, of those incredible hurricanes, record hurricanes that have taken place, taken lives in the Caribbean, taken lives in Florida, and, and taken lives in Texas, Mr. Speaker. We have an obligation to do everything we can to reduce Answer. climate change. The leadership that we have taken, Mr. Speaker, is the single greatest climate change initiative during our time, and that's getting us off of coal, Thank moving you. us to cleaner sources of power like wind. Thank We're you. proud of that commitment, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, just briefly, I wanted to say on behalf of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Caucus, our uh, deepest, deepest condolences for the loss of uh, Arnold Chan to the uh, to the Liberal Party that he worked with, uh, to his uh, friends and family. I had the opportunity to serve with Arnold in Ottawa uh, for uh, close to a year and seen him at community events. There was no one uh, more decent and devoted, uh, always putting partisanship aside and, frankly, the, the gold standard of what you'd like to see in a human being and a, and a public servant. So our, our condolences with everyone feeling this loss today. Thank you. Thus ends question period, and I would uh, entertain a point of order from the uh, member from Brampton Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was running a little bit late for introductions, so I wanted to introduce a few of the guests here in the gallery. I want to welcome our member of Le the Legislative Assembly of Punjab Party, who is here to, with us today, Mr. Harminder Singh Gill and his wife, Mrs. Parmjeet Gill, along with their daughter, Maclean Kaur Gill, and also my good friend, Raj Sandhu, who is the city councillor from Bradford, his wife, Mrs. Rana Sandhu, and Mr. Shiv Gill and Mr. Gurpreet Singh. Thank you so much. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.